Welcome, everyone, to this high-level briefing on the health and security perspectives of climate change. I'm Fiona Godley. I'm editor-in-chief of the BMJ, and it's a great pleasure to see so many of you here at the end of one very interesting week for politics in the UK, especially security in politics in the UK, and the beginning of another with um, all the climate change interests this morning in the press, which is a very good timing for us. This meeting is really the brainchild of one man, Hugh Montgomery, who those of you who know him will agree is a, a force of nature. Most of you will have at some stage in the last week received an email from Hugh, and if you haven't, you will be receiving one from him in the next week, I'm sure. And um, Hugh's emails are impossible to ignore, um, which is very good news for all of us because he's made it his life's work, or the next bit of his life's work, uh, to tackle climate change. And I think the, the very fascinating thing about this meeting is it was his idea to bring in the crucial element of security and had the good luck to get in touch with Neil Morissetti and Lionel Jarvis at the Ministry of Defence. Um, and the result of that was initially a dinner, of course, always in this in these, um, environment, uh, but also an editorial in the BMJ uh, with Hugh and Lionel and Neil, and also Ian Gilmore, former president of the Royal College of Physicians. So a pretty eminent group, really telling the medical world in particular that we have a problem and we've got to confront it. Um, the meeting, however, is a, an enormous collaboration, and you can see on the slide here the number of groups who have come together to help us put this meeting on. And it's not only been financial support, but moral support that we've really, really needed to try and gather this very... Um, excellent group of delegates um, on this Monday morning. So in particular, the BMJ, the Climate and Health Council, the European Climate Foundation, and two degrees um, with, as I say, crucial input from military experts and also from the Department of Health. So we've had a steering group, uh, and, and it's been a, a very interesting experience to try and get the concept of the meeting nailed down properly. The aim of the meeting is to look at the stark realities of climate change and to... Um, really try to progress discussion on how to secure our future well-being in light of the threats that those, that poses. So we have a statement, there's a draft statement which has been released to the press this morning with a lot of signatures already on it and we hope that those of you who haven't signed it will do so during the meeting and if you need to find out how to do that you can ask at the registration desk. Please, please do sign that. It will be published in the BMJ later on this week with all of your signatures on it if you sign it. Very, very grateful to our sponsors from uh, support from UCL and from Dr. Gunhild Stradalen from Norway, who is here. Gunhild, thank you so much indeed for your help. Um, welcome to you all, delegates, for coming um, from a number of countries around the world. Very lovely to see you all. I should say that it's Chatham House rules this meeting, and I'm hoping the rules will come up here. Uh, Chatham House is a funny concept in the, in the, day, in the age of tweeting, but the rule is you can do, tweet to your heart's content during the presentations, but the discussions are... Um, Chatham House, so, so not to share those outside this room. Uh, if you could please stick with that, that would be um, much appreciated. Um, however, having said that, the aim of the meeting is to be as interactive as possible. Uh, lots of time for discussion on the programme, we hope. The roving mics will come out. Please say who you are when you, when you ask a question. Please Twitter, tweet, um, health and security hashtag. Uh, we want your ideas on how to take this forward. This is a meeting which is not a meeting for its own sake. It's a meeting to begin a conversation which we hope will be very fruitful. So please, either through Twitter or through notes at the reception desk or conversations during the day, please tell us how to take this forward. Um, there's a drinks reception immediately after. We hope as many of you as possible will stay for that. Another opportunity for networking, for conversations about how we can make real progress here. The sessions will be videoed and those videos will be made available to you all after the meeting one way or another, and we'll also be interviewing the speakers and, and collecting a, a group of conversations for you to share with others after the meeting. Briefly, a bit of housekeeping. There will be a fire alarm, I'm pretty sure it's Monday, at 11 o'clock, so there's no fire, so do not feel you have to leave your seats. Um, please, if you haven't already, could you turn your phones off? And um, that completes my uh, introductory remarks. I'm in a moment going to hand you over to our host for the morning, uh, John Snow. Delighted he's here to host. But first, um, very, very pleased to be able to uh, introduce the Secretary of State for the Environment, joining us by video, Chris Hune. Hello. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person today. I understand that Neil Morissetti will be with you, so I know that you're in safe hands. 
but I wanted to take this chance to say a few words about climate, health and security. The science of climate change is clear. Greenhouse gases trap heat and warm the planet. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is rising rapidly, 40% up since pre-industrial times, and global temperatures are also rising, up by about 0.8 degrees since 1900. This poses a serious threat to our health and our security, globally and locally. Extreme weather events are the most visible impact. Man-made greenhouse gas emissions roughly double the risk of the floods in the UK in the year 2000, and more than double the risk of the 2003 European heat wave. But continuing climate change could also change the distribution of disease and put further pressure on scarce food and water resources for a growing world population. And the world's poorest will be hit hardest. These pressures in turn could threaten our security. Increasing competition over resources alongside growing demand and pressures on trade routes could provide conflict in areas where poverty and instability already meet. Our society will need to adapt to a changing climate, but we also need to respond urgently to limit the impacts by reducing our emissions now. Luckily, the solutions also present compelling opportunities. Investing in low-carbon technologies will promote green growth, boosting productivity, innovation and efficiency. That's good for business and good for the economy. And there is a definite first mover advantage. In fact, it's not just our economy that will benefit if we get to grips with climate change quickly. Early action will mitigate the risk of further famine and drought, hinder the spread of disease and avoid exacerbating conflicts around the world. It will also bring significant health benefits an increase in life expectancy, fewer working days lost due to respiratory and cardiac diseases. In short, it will mean a cleaner, healthier, safer future for us all. Today's meeting is about how we can get there. You are the people that can make a difference. Your influence can ensure more people not only listen, but act. I wish you all the very best for the rest of the day. Thank you very much to Chris Hewn, and I would now like to introduce a second speaker who is going to help to introduce us to the issues of the day, who is Lord Michael Jay, who is going to come and speak to us in person. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Fiona. I hope I haven't been too upstaged by the, uh, the Secretary of State, but I'm delighted to, uh, to be here. And uh, the numbers of you here today uh, show clearly the importance of the subject. And I think also what is hugely important is the timing of this uh, uh, conference, just uh, weeks away from the Climate Change Summit in Durban. Now, it wasn't always like this. Uh, the first climate change meeting uh, I went to was when I was working for Tony Blair as his uh, G. H. Sherpa before the summit in Glen Eagles uh, in 2005. And when I told my G. H. colleagues uh, that the British Prime Minister intended climate change to be one of the two main themes of the G. H. summit, there was a pause followed by a rather puzzled question from one of my colleagues: Why does the British Prime Minister want to focus on a third-order issue like that? Now, times have changed, and I think the speech we've just had from uh, Chris Hoon shows that hardly anybody now, whatever their views on climate change, would doubt the importance of the issue. Certainly not anyone here today, though I hope and I have a little doubt, judging by the conversations I've already had uh, uh, over coffee beforehand, that this day will bring a lively discussion and I hope a good deal of controversy, because this is a controversial topic. I'm sure that will be the case. W what then are the facts? The climate is warming, and the vast bulk of scientific evidence shows that man is responsible. There's growing international consensus on the need to try to keep the rise in temperature down to two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by 2100. Some would like 1.5. I think myself that that's probably beyond what is doable, 
but two degrees Celsius ought to be a realistic target. But, and it's a huge but, the rise in temperature by 2100, if there is business as usual, is estimated to be five degrees Celsius. And even if all the present climate change policies and commitments are met, it will still be 4.3 degrees Celsius. So there is a huge amount to do to get that target down to two degrees. And the impact of failing to do so would be hugely serious. I've no doubt that today's discussions will make that clear. But I think that the important thing to recognize also is that this is not just tomorrow's problem. It's not just 2100 that we need to have in mind. The effects of climate change are already being felt around the world. Let's consider four different examples. For years now, there has been civil war in Darfur, in Sudan. That has, of course, a crucial political dimension. But it is also caused by migration, by lack of basic resources, by the clash of traditions and ways of life exacerbated by a changing climate. There you have climate change, you have health, you have security affecting what is happening on the ground. The same is true of the drought in Somalia and the huge refugee camps in Kenya. And uh, I, I myself chair an international medical aid uh, charity, Merlin, but uh, I hope that all of us here at the, uh, at the headquarters of the BMA can hope and pray for the safety of the doctors from Médecins Sans Frontières who were kidnapped uh, in Kenya last week. Thirdly, in Bangladesh, just a small, sea, a small rise in sea levels and an increase in violent weather conditions, both likely results of a warming climate, will have, and I think one has to say not could have, but will have, a devastating effect on up to 75 million people living in the Delta. And fourthly, quite different, but just as dramatic, the Arctic is melting. A commercially viable sea passage across the top of the world is now, I think, only a matter of time. And that will, of course, bring economic advantages, cutting journey time between the Far East and Europe, uh, and, of course, cutting emissions. But as a partially uncharted and undelineated seaway is open to shipping, it will also bring environmental and, indeed, possibly security threats. So in their different ways, all these examples show the links between climate change, health, and security. They show what's happening now, and they emphasize the need for action. I have to say that at the international level, recent progress has been disappointing. The Copenhagen summit dashed the hopes of many. The summit in Cancun partially retrieved the process, but with little progress on substance. And as a result of that, there is understandable caution about next month's summit in Durban. The eyes of world leaders are focused far more on the immediate financial problems the world faces than on the problems of climate change. Solving these problems will not be costless, and the political appetite for costs just now is low. It is important, really important, to put sustained pressure on the negotiators at Durban and on their political masters to realize that even in difficult times, we do no service to this and future generations by failing to take the tough measures that are needed. The first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol expires next year, and we need international agreement on either an extension or on something new to replace it. But we also need to put pressure on governments to take and stick to measures at the national level. The European Union has been far-sighted in fighting climate change. It must not slip back now. The British Climate Change Act was far-sighted too. Korea is taking a lead on sustainable development with its pioneering Green Growth Act and is looking too at emissions trading legislation. China has identified eight cities and five provinces as low-carbon pilot zones and is developing a comprehensive climate change law. And there is clear evidence that firms, or at least some firms, see climate change as a challenge that must be faced. 
the emphasis, for example, on electric or hybrid cars, on low carbon energy, energy efficiency, and smart grids. Now, all that is good, but let us not be naive about that. It's important, it helps, but it is nothing like enough to solve the problem. It is, if you like, an encouraging pulse of low carbon activity in a high carbon world. There is a real need for more commitment and more action at the international, national, and industrial level. And this, it seems to me, is where today's meeting comes in. I have absolutely no doubt that meeting such of this can have a real effect on the debate and on the actors and on the action that needs to be taken. The case for action is clear, and I'm sure we shall hear that today. The science is overwhelming and frankly doesn't need exaggerating. Amid the hype we sometimes hear, it does seem to me that calm, dispassionate, science-based advocacy is at a premium because calm, dispassionate, science-based advocacy is frankly frightening enough. But we need to, to recognize and explain the breadth and depth of the climate change challenge, that it will have an effect on the health of populations through much of the globe. In fragile environments, that effect can be catastrophic for many. And as we are already seeing, that can lead to a breakdown of security, of law and order, to kidnappings, in the worst case, to war, which in turn has an effect on the health and well-being of innocent people caught up in it. This really is a vicious circle. Much of that might seem far, far away, but in an increasingly independent world, it affects us all, for climate knows no frontiers. Today's meeting gives us all a chance to look at these issues in depth, to learn from each other, to see the interconnections, and to make the results known afterwards in whatever way we can. That, I think, is a hugely important part of the meeting too. Uh, Fiona, for myself, I can't wait to get started. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and now, moving on to our first session, could I invite the four speakers panelists onto the stage? Um, and I'm delighted to introduce our host for the whole of the morning, uh, who will be known to all of you, and needs no introduction, John Snow. <laughs> 